My guest today is well-known trumpet player and arranger Jerry Hay. Jerry and his section created a horn sound that's heard on some of the biggest records of the late 70s, 80s, and 90s, including Michael Jackson, Earth, Wind, and Fire, Lionel Richie, The Brothers Johnson, Al Jarreau, Toto, and so many others. Check it out. This series was conducted in the spring of 2020 via Instagram, and the audio and video quality do reflect that format. However, the words and insights of these guests are still priceless. There we go. There we go. Hey. All right. I even had my uh, audio engineer specialist to help me out. Well, it's good that you know some audio engineers. It is very good that I know some, yes. <laughs> All right, so I always do this in the beginning. In case anybody doesn't know, but I'm guessing everybody here knows about you. But I always say a little bit about the people that I'm talking to. Um, so I'll just say my little bit here. Jerry's an iconic arranger and trumpet player. He developed a sound with his horn section that included uh, mainstay players Gary Grant, Larry Williams, Bill Reichenbach, and at other times included Chuck Finley, Kim Hutchcroft, Andy Hall, and I believe Ernie Watts, amongst others. Dan Higgins. Dan Higgins, right. His horn arrangements and playing and his section were the exclusive sound on virtually everything that Quincy Jones touched from the late 70s until now, including all of the notable Michael Jackson recordings, Brothers Johnson, Earth, Wind & Fire, and others. Uh, other notable work includes virtually every horn uh, sound on all the Al Jarreau records, big hits like Toto Rosanna, Flashdance, Lionel Richie, and others. You know, we can spend all day listing your credits, but uh, discography has you listed at over 1,700 records, so I don't think we have time for that. <laughs> um, <laughs> and most unfortunate for him, he happens to be my uncle, so he's stuck here. <laughs> I had to do this. <laughs> he had to do this. Family obligation. Um, and I didn't earn the relationship. He's just, he's the unlucky one. Anyway, where do we start? Uh, there are a lot of places where we could start, but let's talk about studying at, at IU, at in Indiana with Bill Adam. Well, I went to uh, Indiana with a friend of mine that I met at uh, music camp Interlochen in northern Michigan and uh, went there not knowing much about the school other than my friend said that it was one of the world's largest music schools and that they had three trumpet teachers there, one of whom had played in the Cleveland Orchestra for the first trumpet for 23 years, Louis Davidson. I thought, okay, well, we'll go there and I'll be, you know, we'll be roommates and I'll figure it out. And I went there and was one of the most fortunate occurrences in my life was to be uh, Mr. William Adams' student. I, I wasn't originally. I was. Uh, I auditioned and I did uh, got second in the auditions as a freshman into the orchestra, and I went into my teaching assistant for my first lesson who was Walt Blanton, also a student of Mr. Adams, and he marched me down the hall, knocked on Mr. Adams' door, shoved me in the door, here's your trumpet teacher. So that's how I got hooked up with maybe the greatest man I've ever known. Yeah, and you, and you, you stayed in contact with him, and you even went back and, and would take kind of tune-up lessons with him from time to time. Many times, as do all of his students that he ever had always would go back and get a refresher wow. course. But you didn't, uh, you didn't, you didn't finish it, Indiana. You had an opportunity. Was it first in Hawaii? Was that the? Yeah, of course you had to bring that up that I didn't graduate from Indiana. Thanks a lot. Yeah, no, I did not. That's your, been your downfall. Yeah, if I'd only graduated, it, I could have had a pretty good career. <laughs> But I was in taking a lesson one day, phone rang in Mr. Adams' office, and he's talking to this person for a while, and he said, here, they want to talk to you. And, and it was Larry Hall. And he had already gone over to Hawaii, and he uh, said, you know, we're looking for another trumpet player. Are you interested? And I thought, well, yeah, I guess so. I need to ask Mr. Adams what he thought. And so, you know, hung up the phone. And, said, Mr. Adam, what do you think? And he said, you've learned all you're going to learn here. You're going to go over there with Larry, and you guys will kill it. 
go. So, you know, what more can you say? You know, the guy, you know, that's, that's why you take from him for them to push you out the door and say, you're ready. It was that straight into sea wind. What, what was the gig? Uh, it, it was a Vegas type show from a Hawaiian entertainer entertainer. And his name was Dick Jensen. And he was fantastic. I mean, really great. And we, and the, the, uh, band was when i went over there we played 10 weeks at this club right on waikiki beach and it was larry hall and myself and rick baptist's cousin wow played third trumpet larry williams kim hutchcroft and another guy from indiana another saxophone player from indiana with a great rhythm section and we were playing like all of the the guy was kind of a pop guy, so he wanted to play all of the current hits. So we were doing all of the 25 or 6 to 4 and Vehicle and The Letter and, you know, it just got to be danced to the music. It, it was nonstop blow. Wow. Wow. And then, and then you guys formed Sea Wind out of some of this or you joined together? And then because, so we, play, we did this show for 10 weeks and then all of a sudden it's like, well, we don't have any work now. Now what do we do? Okay, so we, we got together and we're just playing kind of in, in the park on a Sunday afternoon. You know, we had uh, Gary Grant was also over there. We had a big band that we would play in the park and then we'd play with this smaller group and Gary was a part of that. And uh, Larry Hall, Kim Hutchcroft, Larry Williams, and then kind of the the beginnings of Sea Wind, the drummer, Bob Wilson, and the bass player, Ken Wilde. Bob was in the service in Hawaii, and Ken's parents lived there. So that was kind of our excuse to play whatever we wanted to play. So we were doing all kinds of stuff. So basically, that's how Sea Wind formed, is from, you know, a lack of having any work. And, and then you, you, hit the, uh, you hit the road with Sea Wind. We did. And it was yeah. wild success and first class travel and Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Oh, in your dreams. No, we played in this funky club in Alaska for eleven weeks and we never saw uh the uh you know, 'cause it was it was kind of at the end of the summer, so that, you know, the we never saw dark because we played from nine to four. So you know, it was 24 hours of daylight kind of up there for us. Which wow. Was weird. And we were making like, I don't know, something stupid, like on a good week would be a hundred dollars maybe. <laughs> and then, and then we moved to Phoenix and then things really got good when we were a good week was $25 and a bad week was 15. <sighs> well, so we, yeah, it was a little rough, but you know, that we're playing, you know, together and, trying to figure out what we wanted to do. And it was a good, a, a great learning experience. And was this, you had already recorded for CTI or you no. hadn't made records? No, no this, is, this is before we moved to LA. And then uh, you, did, you move, did you move to LA from, a, from calls that you got or did you move to LA as a band and then you started getting calls? We had been playing in these clubs over in Hawaii and when people, Musicians would come over either on their way to or from Japan, or if they're coming over for vacation, they'd, okay, where do, what music should we go here? And people, well, they would find out about us. So people started coming in to see us play. Um, Neil Schoen from Journey came and played, sat in. His, Jeff Vaccaro was playing with Sonny and Cher, and I played the show, and he, he and David Page came in. Abraham Laboriel sat in us with us one time. Uh, a bunch of people. Lee Rittenauer came in. Harvey Mason Sr. came in. And that's he's kind of started the ball rolling about, well, you know, you guys need to come over to L.A. and, you know, maybe we can get a contract. And so Harvey really kind of started the ball rolling. Wow. And then you came to L.A. and what were some of your first non-sea wind calls in L.A.? See, when it was playing at the Baked Potato, um, the, the off night at the Baked Potato, I think, was Monday night off. And it had been for a long time 
Lee Rittenauer, Harvey Mason Sr., uh, Dave or Don Grusin, maybe, um, and Abraham Laboriel, I guess, maybe. I'm not sure who else, but it was, it was basically Lee for a long time. And then he was going out on the road, and, and Harvey got us into the baked potato. So we're playing the baked potato. People would come in to hear the baked potato. And they started coming up, well, I'm doing a record. Would you be interested in playing some horns on it? Okay. Well, who's writing? Well, you are. Well, it was just like that. All of a sudden, you're. Yeah, yeah, and I wasn't really. I never studied arranging or anything, and then just wanted. They liked the way we sounded, and they wanted some of that. So, uh, you know, there was uh, really a lot of records that didn't really do anything, but we got uh, we got a learning experience on their dime. You know, we'd, we'd play something, I'd write something, and we'd go in and listen to it. And, you know, oh, that's horrible. You know, let's change that and figure out what we liked and how we got there. And that's kind of how, you know, if, if there is such a thing as me having a horn sound, that is how that came about. It's just so like, it was through experimenting. But, yeah. but what, what could you cite as your influences for the style of writing that you essentially created was it james brown was it chicago transit uh the the what i tried to do in depending depending on who the artist was is because c when when c when first started out we were kind of a top 40 band so we were playing what is hip soul vaccination uh some brecker brothers stuff and so, and Aretha Franklin, and, you know, a little smattering of, of everything. So, you know, for those horn parts, I'd have to learn how to write those horn parts. So I kind of understood how the Breckers got that trumpet alto tenor sound on some of their things. And, and then I got how the five horn Tower of Power sound did that and sort of where they put everything. So by that analyzing, then when somebody would ask me to write of course it would depend on the style of the tune uh and you know i, I would in like in the case of earth wind and fire maybe i would go back and listen to earlier earth wind and fire okay this is where they're they are how can i m advance that you know make that better and not better necessarily but make it mine still keeping it in the style of earth wind and fire yeah yeah and and you you did more with kind of tight doubling and layering than your predecessors had done if i yeah, probably so uh i figured out a way to to try to take the engineer out of his idea of what the balance should be in a horn section because sometimes you would go in there and the saxophone would be just like burning or the trombone would be really loud uh, and if they put up if you have two trumpets and they put up two trumpet mics and then the trumpet balances off so i so with that in mind it was always one trumpet mic for for three maybe even four guys always and then if we're having, if it's four horns, two trumpets, trombone, sax, I would, I started out inverting on the double track the trombone and saxophone notes. So that on the first track, the trombone's playing a note and the saxophone playing the other note. And then on the double track, they would switch. So that balance between the two of them, even if the trombone was too loud, both notes would be heard uh, as opposed to the trombone double tracking his own note and making it doubly as loud. So that was one of the little tricks that I learned after working with a lot of really bad engineers. But you, you needed to have microphones that were pretty neutral so that you could do that swap and not have a mic that would favor, you know, some mic might favor frequencies of saxophone over trombone. Oh, I would just switch notes and not switch mics. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm, so, I'm saying, 
did you make I later you made a lot of decisions about what microphones were your favorites in the early days was did that even play for you? I mean, did it did it I, I didn't know anything about a microphone for a long time until well, not for a long time, t until we started working with Bruce. And then it was like, okay, Bruce, what's going on here? Why does that sound so amazing? You know, it, well, you know, his microphones, no one literally touched his microphones. So right. they were all pristine and he bought them new. So, you know, he's putting up, he's putting up a 47 that he used on Dinah Washington, you know, and, uh, you know, crazy stuff. Yeah. Uh, so that's, you know, that was kind of the first, uh, my first in view of the microphone situation. He said he wasn't doing anything. I'm not sure I believe that, but, but maybe so. Uh, it just, you know, why does it sound that good with Bruce? Okay, we go to the next place, and I have him put the same mics, although they're not his, on us, and it sounds horrible. So, wow. So well, then I ended up buying mics. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, well, I mean, we can talk about this later, but we can talk about it now. You were using a FET 47 at one point, but I know that you've been a big fan of the Cam 54, which, unfortunately for everybody, is really expensive and rare and fragile and all those things. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, what... Went into a studio, uh, a session one time with uh, Alan Sides, who owns Ocean One, uh, Ocean Way, uh -huh. here and in Nashville. And it was a hard, an intense song, and it had flugelhorn. And so usually one or the other suffers, usually the flugelhorn. Um, but I went in to hear the playback, and I went, wow, what is that? And he said, KM54. So that's another big moment for me. He said that's his favorite trumpet mic, and he has, I, he had something like 200 of them. When, he, when the Berlin Wall went down, he went to East Germany and bought every Neumann mic he could find. He has Hitler's announcement mic. It's crazy. So, you know, he's got all of those choices, and that's the mic he puts up. Okay. So then I went out and bought one, and you said fragile, yes, and we used it for about a year or something, and then it sounded like, yeah, like that. So I had to send it to this guy named Klaus, who yep. was Klaus the main guy. guy. Yeah, the, the guy. Sent it to him, and this is in the 80s, and it was 1500 to repair it back then. Uh, but, and then I found two more, uh, matched pair. So I have three now. Yeah. But I also use the Royers a lot also. The 121, a, the regular one. Both I have. Yeah. Uh, they're both really good. Always put them on trombone. We've done so many sessions with trombone where uh, one in particular was a Louis, Luis Miguel session where it was super hard. We did the whole song, and I went in and listened to it, and the trombone mic sounded horrible. It sounded like he was playing a Kleenex trombone, it, <laughs> like that. And I had him solo up the trombone, like, buddy, what are you listening to? You know, I'm, come on. But we had to redo that whole song, so it took us another four hours because this guy screwed up. So the Royer can take the trombone level. Whereas he had a he had a uh, a U forty seven on the trombone and it was just blowing it out. Wow! So wow. yeah, so right, very so careful back, with that. I want to back up to the arranging. We got off on the mic thing because somebody asked a mic question. We were. Uh, I want to back up to arranging. So you started working with Quincy in seventy nine or seventy eight. Seelin moved from Hawaii in seven, January of seventy six. And uh -huh. I'm sitting at home, and we'd been playing at the baked potato for a little bit, um, and the phone rings. Uh, Jerry, hey, yeah, uh, this is Quincy Jones. Oh, oh, you're kidding. No, I, said, I want you to come in and play on a record. Great. When? You know, I'm there. And I want you to do the arranging. What do you mean you want me to do the arranging? No, I want you to do the arranging. He said, I, I, you know, I've heard some great things about the horns. 
okay, you know, great. So we played on his album called I Heard That, was the first thing we did with him. And it's an instrumental tune called Midnight Soul Patrol. Not much of anything, uh, but he liked what we did. It was just a little, you know, dun, 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 dun you know, not, not a lot. Uh, but one, that was the first time I got to play with Snooky Young, who was maybe my hero, and it got the foot in the door with Quincy. So that was the first thing we did. And then the next thing was uh, the Brothers Johnson Blam album. Yep. That was the, the first big record that we did. And we played on, I don't know, seven or eight songs on that one. We played a song called Rhino Rocket, which opens up the record that we did. And uh, this, the vamp is five minutes and 14 seconds long, of which probably 20 seconds got on the record. But we were playing nonstop, and so we did the vamp, and G Gary Grant was on this one. This was a full horn section. Gary Grant, Bill Reichenbach, Larry Williams, and Kim Hutchcroft and myself. We did the vamp, and Gary goes, all right, guys, let's do this. Let's do the double track in one take. So we did the double track, five minutes and 15 seconds in one take, and it is screamingly hard. And... The next day, we come in to do the next set of tunes. We walk into the studio, and Quincy and Bruce have this thing cranked up to, like, ear-shattering level. We kind of looking around, we kind of go, yeah, we're in. So that was really what did it. Wow. And then, uh, and then not long after that, you were working on, you know, Everybody thinks of Thriller, but I think most musicians think Off the Wall is the one. Yeah. <clears throat> I would agree. It's not, it wasn't a popular success. Yeah, but the, the sound of that record, the organic feel of the whole record, acoustic yeah. instruments and lots of horns. Uh, I know everybody wants to know this. Talk about what you were given to write to, how long you had to write, what kind of direction there was. Uh, this uh, was at a time when Sea Wind was, now we had made a record, and we were touring. So Quincy called and said, you know, I want you to do horn, strings and horns for Michael Jackson record. Um, Quincy, we're, you know, we're out on the road. When do you want to do this? I said, I, I don't know if I can do that uh, because... You know, we're traveling. It's and we were on the East Coast. And I said we have two days off. We were in Boston, and then we had two days off, and we were back. Then playing the next night in Wake Forest. I said we got these two nights off. We could take a red eye from Boston, and then play those the, the a long day. And then if we need to do something. Maybe in the morning of the next day, we got to get back to Wake Forest. And so that's what we did. And I didn't write the strings because, I mean, back in the day, how do you do that? And you're out on the road. You know, it, it, it's too hard. And plus, I had never really written strings before, even though Quincy wanted me to do it. I hadn't really written strings at that point. So, uh, you know, he sends a cassette and... Uh, because of the Brothers Johnson Blam record, he knew what I could do, and uh, he, he sent the cassette and said, go for it, and do your thing, and didn't really, there wasn't much uh, direction in that, you know, so I had the cassette out in the road, and I, I don't even know how I wrote the horn parts, or where I wrote the horn parts, or any of Sitting in a hotel room in a van, or writing down... I guess, I, I guess when we were... You know, during the day when we weren't playing or when we were driving somewhere, I, you know, I'm sure I was listening to it, but, so. And what was on those, what was on those guides? Bass, uh, section, scratch vocal? Pretty much finished vocals. Oh, wow. And, I mean, pretty much finished everything but horns, although I didn't have the strings on Don't Stop. Uh, and I'm not sure if I had any strings that before then. 
Uh, but but everything, all of the, you know, when Rod does a tune, especially Rod, he does it all or did it all uh, and then did all of the vocals. And uh, like Rock With You and stuff, I didn't even talk to, didn't meet Rod with Rock With You. Uh, and, uh, you know, I just did my thing. And, but he would finish his whole song other than the horn parts at that point. Yeah, because you 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 wrote such uh, stuff that filled the spaces in in such perfect ways that it would be hard to imagine how you could write that without having some other the other references in there. It, yeah, you have to, to really do it right. The the tune has to be, I'd say, ninety percent there, because you know people send you stuff. Well, it, you know we're not gonna we're gonna put some backgrounds on it, and you know we're gonna add some you know, more guitars or more keyboards or whatever. Well, okay, is that going to change the feel of how the tune is to a, from a, or to a, to a, you know, to a 16th note type feel? Is it, you know, are you going to fill my space, you know, or am I going to fill your space? So the more info that you can get, the better. Yeah. And so how long would it take to track, you know, you had your arrangements and you'd been working with your guys now for closely for six, seven years with that section, if my math is right. And how long would it take you to go in the studio and do like um, one of the less aggressive, like Rock With You? You're doing well, that, I mean, Rock With You is, you know, it's kind of flugel chorus thing yeah. and some little chords and then the you know dun 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 in the bridge yeah. right so i mean we we quincy just did the his documentary and the jackson estate would not give him the rights to use michael's records as background music on his documentary he wanted to have so we redid thriller and rock with you because Rod's estate would give Quincy the right to use the tune, especially without Michael's vocal. So we redid those. So we did rock with you. And it probably took, oh, I don't know, 20 minutes, you know. But that was Andrew Engineering. We played it before. There was no discussion of what to do or anything. So how long, but what about a, what about a, a, an arrangement that was really built. And if anybody hasn't seen this, there's a really great example of working day and night and how those parts fit together on the studio. That's that's on YouTube. I think it's broken down where you had so that part. That was a, a cassette that I got from the day of the session that we did it. And, and Bruce, I told Bruce to break, you know, give me a cassette with just the one side on and then give me a cassette with the other. And he broke it in, and then he added claps, and then, you know, kind of did his own thing on it, just for me to have, basically. So that one in particular, because the 16th notes in that section have to be so together to pull that off, that I can remember it taking a while. Not, not too long, because you would... We would go in and we would play the first part, and then did we double that part, the the part that goes that part. So we yeah. doubled that part, and then we put the other part on that goes that part. So then you yeah. got to go in and hear it, and Bruce kept everything in stereo, so it's. It's as opposed to one side being on one speaker and the other side being on the other speaker, and they would go ticka 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 back and forth between right. the speakers. This is all stereo on top of each other, quadruple track, two tracks of one part, two tracks of the other. So you go in, and if it's not lining up together, you got to figure out what part is not together. So there was a little bit of okay, well let's hear the first track of the first part. Okay, how does that feel? And we did it, I think we ended up recording to just drums. I can uh, imagine. 
Yeah. So, you know, recording to just drums and then listening to just drums to make sure that was that. And then, you you know, you listen to the second track of the first pass. Same thing. And you make sure all of that it's tight. And then you have to go <coughs> listen to the first track of the second part. Same thing. <coughs> and, uh, you know, it, it, it took a while to get it so that it was tick, 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 like that. Right, like right. M more machine rather than tick, 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 tick. Yeah, because it, it can very easily. Right, right. And it, when you were writing this, obviously, in fact, I was surprised. I think when I visited you in ninety, you still weren't using any computer for anything. You weren't uh, I, one thing. I I haven't for until. Probably the last four years, guys have been asking demos, and you know, guys, I got forty years of demos. You know, you know what I do, but you know, some guys just can't deal with not hearing what it's going to, some kind of semblance of what it's going to be. So you so know, you, Andrew set me up with Logic. So you're on the but, you're on the road, and you're writing that part, the working day and night stacked part, where you're writing it in grand staff, so you could see the stuff. Were you singing it to yourself and writing it separate? Uh, you... So I wrote, uh, I, I, I think I probably wrote uh, the da -da 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 first. Uh -huh. And then looking at that and seeing where the 16th notes of that part aren't. And what the rhythm has to be to fill in the gaps on the other side of the 16th note. So you get it back and forth. Right. So right. that comes from the opening of the tune. Michael goes. He does that. Wow. That's what he does. Yeah. So. That's that. That's where I got that. Wow. So in work, you know, working day and night, you know, you just got to be busy. And how do you get it busy? And so, wow, that's all. So, what what kind of thing you mentioned that you did that to? You think just drums? What would your typical headphone mix be for a lot of these sessions? Half drum, headphone. one sided headphones always, mm -hmm. which I believe is different than the guys in New York who generally, I I believe, used to like to have two headphones a mix in their phones with them in the phones and you know echo and all of that uh seems like that makes it harder for me to hear what everybody else is doing with them when you have two headphones on like that you can't hear the guy next to you intonation especially if you got three microphones for three trumpets the engineer is not very good and the second trumpet mic is too loud you know, you can't really hear. So we play one headphone, even part of partly off, kind of cranked, and drums loud, uh, and bass pretty good, and a little keyboard and guitar information uh, for pitch. Pitch, re pitch reference. For pitch, but that's you know the the pitch part. I take care of the pitch part. You know, I'm I'm good with that so the the pitch usually was not a problem but time is more of a problem uh t to make sure that's right because the drums are going to be the loudest in the mix right so you got to be with the drums now when you're writing these uh when you're writing these arrangements and you're writing stuff that probably with these guys you have a shorthand and they understand what you want how did you notate things like cutoffs and do it's and shakes and 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 fall offs and how did you write them in a way that they would always be the same with the section Did you guys write minus one or two you know the typical we, we, stuff or uh yeah we did sometimes it, it got because we played so much together um and generally i didn't write phrasing because it was just kind of understood usually when I wrote something, unless it was kind of quirky phrasing that I intentionally wanted. Uh, and 
as far as cutoffs and stuff, that there was a whole note there, depending on what the groove was. I mean, if it we'd get off on the last triplet, eighth note of a beat, if it's a whole note. Uh, or, uh, you know, it, we, we would discuss more than me marking it. You know, yeah, often, you know, and a four on that one or the last 16th of the bar or, you know, we're going to one here, you know. So it was more discussed than actually written down. And, you know, a lot of times we'd get in there and what I thought was going to be the best way to play this, you know, guys, other guys would ha have suggestions and, you know, wh who's ever got the best idea wins. Now, on uh, on. Uh... On you mentioned unless there was something that was really specifically an effect. Thinking about those Duro sessions you did, like high crimes and those really athletic sessions where you have stuff that's blah, 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 all that. You must have written those and deciding about a place to, for those to come from and those crescendos and. Oh uh, yes, uh, but uh, again, some of those were still like on the spot. You know, let's let's do that. You know, hi, that let's. Let's just do that, you know, because I, because I, he's singing, and you know, let's kind of get out of his way at the beginning of that. So some of the some of that stuff was on the spot, but like the lick in a tune called Black and Blues, it goes, -da 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 -da. yeah, that was definitely a written uh, articulation, because that's the only way that you can really make it sound like that and play it like that. I mean, you can slur the whole thing, but it, you know, it's like that. But that this way, it cleans it up, still swings. Uh, we found out when we were doing this kind of stuff that um, to make stuff not quite feel so stiff, instead of going like a phrase like, oh, let's see, I don't know. Like that phrase. I mean, sometimes you're going to want to be. But like the Jero stuff is kind of slick, you know, so that was. You know, so so it's a slicker kind of phrasing and a little greasier kind of phrasing. Right. So we figured we kind of figured that out. That was kind of due for the sea wind. Horn yeah. stuff. Well, that you, that thing you sang just reminded me of uh, the trumpet part for "You Are a Winner," right? And that would have been written slurred. Uh, written slurred, and the trombones are actually grease uh, portamentoing that. Oh yeah, yeah. Like that, they are actually doing that, and 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 I said, and for the trumpets. I'm not sure if Larry Hall or Chuck Finley is on that one, but Gary and me, and uh, I said, don't play it exactly perfectly, like that. Play it a little, somebody play it pretty close. I'm going to play it a little behind. You can play it a little bit ahead so that it kind of smears that from the trumpet. Right, but only in that spot, not on. Da, 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 no, da. yeah, and that was all marked. Da, 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 that's all short. Right. But that again comes from the guitar, which you can't really hear in this mix. The mix that I had, there's a guitar that's going. It goes like that. There's a like a muted chord guitar that is playing that part that you can't ah. really hear because I covered it up. And what about what about specific uh, parts that you wrote that are you know trumpet players look at these parts and and uh, I'm a recovering trumpet player by the way uh, a very good one as a matter I, of fact I, I'm I'm many years without putting a trumpet to my mouth so I want me to too get my coin <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but trumpet players including me say well how did you play that part and I'm thinking about like. Uh, like that stuff, like the what's the intro? I think that was that was high crimes, right? Yeah. And it has some reverse stuff that you did also. Which, but was that? Did you say? Can you play a click and then we'll do it? 
or how did you get that to be how did you get that to be tight together um so that that is one of the classic session stories nightmares i guess uh so i thought okay well let me let me see if i can get it some kind of fancy horn intro by jay graden the producer on this tune because this is going to be a big deal and let me just see what i can get so i came up with that now <laughs> that so we go in to play it and it's chuck finley gary grant myself bill reichenbach charlie loper so and it's a trumpet lick fingering trumpet lick so how do the trombones play that? So Bill found out some way to go out on the slide to play like false harmonics to get like that. So, <laughs> so he's teaching Charlie Loper how to play that. So, and you know, we're, we're all like, okay, you know, having written it, okay, I can play it. I, you know, if, if I couldn't play it, I wasn't going to write it. So, okay, I can play it, you know, Chuck, no problem, Gary, a couple times. Okay, we got it, because it lays pretty good on trumpet. Took a while for the trombones to get it and for us to get it together tight. Okay, and we started. Down one. So we started just like that. Down again. Finally got it up to tempo. Okay, Jay, let's try it. So he's got the click. It's, you know, it's two bars out in front of uh, the drums hit on the end of one. Right? right, yeah. So he's got two bars of click out in front. So I said, okay, we have one bar click and we're picking up into the next bar. So we play it. Play it. It's pretty good. We play it. I don't know. We played it. 20 minutes maybe a half an hour maybe and jay every time said you guys are late no it's you're late what okay let's one more time down one right okay great we played it a few more times and one time it it was just perfect i mean really and jay said you guys are late and i said jay uh, if you don't like it, I, I'll change it. But it's never going to be played by three trumpets and two trombones better than that last take we just played. What are you talking about? I said, Jay, that was perfect. He said, come in here. So, he, <clears throat> so we're playing it. He says, you guys are late. I said, Jay, what are you talking about? I said, it goes, do, 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 Bow one. And he looks at me and he goes, it does? <laughs> and he, said, he listened to it again. He goes, oh, man, that's great. Let's double that. So we played it for about a half an hour. Probably we played it 15 minutes too long. <laughs> so, yeah, that was, that was a tough one. And then the rest of the tune is way too hard. So, but... You know, and, and those sessions were, and that was probably starting at 11 at night, going until 6 or 7 in the morning on that, that song. So what was the stamina like? I, I wanted to ask about this time, because you were so busy with so many records. How did you keep up your stamina to be playing all day? I don't know, you know, that trumpet teachers don't recommend playing the trumpet all day, every day. Yeah. That, that week especially was, um, the Jero session was, the Jero call was the last um, call that we got for that week from Jay. Uh, so we had movies, <clears throat> TV shows and stuff already booked during the day. I mean, back then sessions were starting at, even some starting at eight in the morning. Uh, so you know, Jay wants to do these tunes and, and he doesn't start until 11 is kind of early at night for Jay. 
So well, lucky for him, his studio's in his house. Yeah, right. So you know, we go over there, and I mean, we one time I think he called it for ten, and we got there, and he wasn't out of bed yet because he works all night because yeah. he liked the quiet, no phone calls or anything. Right. Okay. Great. Well, you know, so we start at eleven and go till six or seven, and then we did, and then we had we, Gary and Chuck and I had day calls from nine till six or seven playing all this stuff. And then we go back to Jero and kill ourselves on these things till six or seven in the next morning. And that week I had 12 hours sleep and the rest of the time literally playing trumpet. And the last day, Friday, was uh, after the Thursday finishing up the Jero record, Friday morning at nine o'clock was Bill Conti, 1984, Olympic music. So Bill Conti always has like a zillion trumpets and it's always really hard. So I go home, take a shower, literally get back in the car, go down to the studio, <clears throat> six trumpets. Gary beat me there, so he's on six. I'm not sure who else. I think maybe Bobby Finley was there, uh, and he was on fifth. So I, I got on the fourth trumpet because I'm shot at this point. Can't remember who else was there. Chuck always, like, walks in right on time, and he's first trumpet. And it starts out with strings, da -da -dum, big trumpet solo like like olympic fanfare legit trumpet solo going up to high d i mean he's out in, in the open and we just finished burning on this stuff and he's got to play this solo <laughs> and you know it's i don't know 16 bars long and plays the hell out of it and then it's four pages long in the middle two pages are we're playing all the time in the middle two pages and the last page goes back to the intro again boom another trumpet solo going up to high d and he just i couldn't believe it at that point literally i could hardly play and he's playing the shit out of this solo i'm not kidding you and so then we record it it just sounds beautiful and a violist raises her hand maybe I'd like to check a note, checks a note, wrong note. We have to do it again. And we did it again, and he played it better. Wow. It, it was, that was uh, one of those eye openers that you go, okay, I get Chuck Finley at that point. Because wow. it, was, it was manly, very manly, after that whole week. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. <clears throat> it's a good one. Well, that's uh, that's quite some stamina. Oh, by the way, one thing I didn't ask you about, uh, and I only want to ask you because I already know the answer about off the wall and your horn arrangements. Um, what's those pay? Oh, it was big money back then, really big. You know, uh, it was. You know, I was kind of new in town, and, that, and the Brothers Johnson, although it did pretty well. Uh, you know, I'm still kind of an unknown, haven't done a lot of arranging. So I thought $500 was, I thought that was pretty, yeah, okay, that sounds pretty good, $500. And and it's a one-time fee when you do yeah. those, you know. Uh, so, you know, I got $500 for those. And then I think, you know, by the time it got to Thriller, I might have been, Maybe up to a thousand, but might have been seven fifty. I'm not really sure. Well, you know, you can be, you can feel okay about that because those records aren't, you know, it's just kind but of a one off. Nobody listened to those anyway. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, other other famous trumpet licks include Speed Demon. Right, right. Was that all slur? Was that how did that go? It sound, it's was it just trumpets? No, uh, saxes and uh, it goes up to 
written on trumpet and tenor, high of sharp. So uh, it was Gary and myself, Larry Williams, Kim Hutchcroft, and one of the saxophones, and I'm not sure which one, uh, might have been Kim, switched to alto. Because, <coughs> you know, it's pretty awkward awkward up there, up real high like that. Um, but yeah, like that. It, it, it took us a bit, but not too long. You know, I think we probably did that in 15 minutes, maybe. You know, double, and double yeah. triple track. Uh, just doubled. And with that, at that time, you were, there were separated mics, and you were working with Bruce and Oh uh, yeah, so so that that mic in particular uh, was one that I commented to Bruce on, uh, and it was RCA forty four, big, yeah, mic, you know, uh, and kind of a dark mic, and and exactly, and not taking a lot of level, you know, it's not a mic that can handle a lot of level, and we're two of us are playing that lick into that. And, you know, it's when we played, to get the intensity on tape, you have to play with that intensity. I mean, you can't, you can't play soft and expect him to turn it up loud and sound like that. Right. So, you know, we're playing full out. And Bruce comes out, and he bought this mic new. And, like I said, he's the only one that would ever touch these mics. And he brought it out of the original box, out of the original there's like a cloth zipper thing and he brings Absolutely. and it's like dazzling shiny bright you know and he puts it up and i go bruce this is a really hard horn part uh i'm not sure about an rca 44 for this particular song and he kind of looks at me with the bruce Houdin little chuckle and he twirls his mustache in a bit and he goes i think you're gonna like it <laughs> <laughs> just like that you know and yeah it just sounds like a million bucks yeah you know so that's what happens when you've got great microphones that are in great condition you know that's what they yeah. sound like well with a know. great engineer with a great engineer who although he always every time i ask him bruce what are you doing i'm not doing anything it's going straight to tape I mean, there are a lot of famous licks, but the other one I want to ask about is Rosanna. Toto Rosanna. Oh, uh, a little noise there. And and that part, because I think you played me that tape before the before version of the tape, and it didn't have the synths on it. And uh, but you wrote that lick leading into the chorus. So. Uh... David Page, Marty Page's son, who's the keyboard player in Toto, you know, asked me to, to arrange this. And he said, we have, before the horns are on, there, that Jeff Picaro playing drums, there's a drum lick that goes, do 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 like that. Right. He is playing it. So David had a little idea of what the lick should be. And it was a little keyboardistic, not very friendly to play. I mean, even the Rosanna Lick is a little, it, it's a little hard to play, um, but his was a little harder. So, so I kind of adapted it a little bit to make it a little easier for trumpets. You know, who cares about the saxophone to play anything. Uh, and Panko, Jane Panko from Chicago played on that session and he sounded great on that. So. You know, it was a little combination of David's idea and, and my idea for that particular lick. And then the rest of it's me. And did you, did you do other arranging on that, or was it just horns? No, just horns. But you had done synth arranging and string arranging. I mean, obviously you did string arranging and, uh, and some synth arranging on the other Quincy stuff. And, and I remember being out there and, and being at a date for Dangerous? What was the date that... Bad, I think. Yeah, no. in fact, yeah, it was Speed Demon. You, went, you were at the Speed Demon bass part. No, that's not right. It wasn't Speed Demon. No, it was, no. Uh, it was a Sieta Garrett song. Um, uh, um, 
Ma man in the mirror. Man no. in the mirror. No, it was. I'm pretty sure it was for dangerous. Wow, really? Yeah, it was at Ocean Way, and uh, Boddicker and Rhett Lawrence there with a right. lot of synths. Many with a like room full of synth. Yeah. Yeah. Programming uh, whole notes. Yeah, programming whole notes, finding sounds for whole notes. Yeah. And a million dollars of synth gear. Probably. With Bruce Houdin and the Oreo box of Oreos. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Crazy time. And I remember, I remember Michael came down to the session. Yeah, we had a room there. Yeah. Which, if you have seen that picture with the horn section and Bruce, that's there. Oh yeah, for, pro maybe from maybe from around that time. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Uh, but uh, but you you were doing other arranging already then, so it it seemed like a logical progression to move into later what would be orchestration when you were doing less playing when people had decided that you know we both suffered because keyboards and brass both went out of vogue in the 90s and it was guitars and you know turn of the 20th century and and you right. started doing more orchestrating i did um friend of mine who i had done a bunch of records with uh aaron zygman uh was had done a lot of pop records had a number one hit with the jets called tune called i've got a crush on you um those are synth horn parts on there, but we had done a lot of other horn parts with him. And as is the case, the, the pop world kind of folded in on him too. And he's playing tennis with a guy and the guy says, what do you do? I'm, you know, I'm a musician. What do you do? I'm a director. And it happened to be John Cassavetti's son, Nick Cassavetti's. And he's doing a movie. You want to do, you want to, be involved in a movie. Sure. You know, can you have you written for orchestra? Oh, yeah. Well, he had never really done a movie score. So, and he's got incredible harmonic sense and great melody ideas. And it, all of that is good. The technical part, getting it to a score wasn't his best thing. So he said, do you want to Help me out on this. Yeah, sure. So we did the hit. The first movie that he did was John Q with Denzel Washington. And then his second movie was The Notebook, which yeah. is one of the highest selling uh, soundtrack CDs ever. Uh, and, uh, you know, so he's done, I don't know, he's done something like 50, 60 movies that we've been involved in. Yeah, so, and he likes he likes me to be there, kind of, as his right hand man while he's writing. How's this? And, yeah, okay, that's cool. Well, you know, maybe try this, and you know, and then I help him with orchestration. Although he's more than capable now after having done all those movies, so much so that he has just written a piano concerto that Jean Yves Thibaudet has played in China, Paris, and San Francisco. Wow. Uh, to kind of rave reviews. Yeah, it's really good. I'm wow. very difficult. Very but, difficult. But you, you again, just like you said, you hadn't, you hadn't really studied arranging. You hadn't really studied orchestration, but maybe by osmosis and experience. Because I remember asking you for some help about orchestrating when I was arranging for orchestra with George Michael and right. I asked you about it and you had some points about well this doubling and inner stuff that seems like you'd only know from lots of time in front of an orchestra but but you do you feel like that experience for you came from playing within the orchestra yeah partly I mean I was always interested in going into the booth I whenever any session that I did. I mean, if it was worth going into the booth and hearing, there were many that weren't worth going into here. But the really good sessions, I would go in <clears throat> and listen to it and go, well, that is really cool. What, how did they get that to sound like that? You know, and kind of try to, and I wasn't always being able to look at a score, 
but you know, and listen to it and kind of figure out, okay, you know, that's really cool how they have the whatever bassoon playing with French horn or something, you know, for a weird sound, or how they, you know, voice the strings. Uh, back in the 70s, when I started working for this guy named Don Pystrup, who was a jingle writer in LA, brilliant writer in all categories. I mean, he could write uh, Stravinsky, he named his son's middle name is Igor. <laughs> He's probably as, as, was a, as foremost authority on Stravinsky as anybody. Uh, he could write like Stravinsky, he could write like Fellini, he'd have uh, Freddie Hubbard and Hubert Laws come in and play on jingles and write jazz things. He's got two tunes on the greatest Buddy, Hit, Buddy Rich Hits album that he wrote, uh, New Blues for, and I forget what the other one was. Great writer. So I was, that was one of my first accounts in town. And I went in there and was brilliant. And he would have, for the jingle, if it was a jingle, he would write on top of the score, he would write the hundredth of a second every beat yes he would write and and then he would write on the next line and then he would write what's happening on the screen and then he would write a full orchestra score and you could look at the bass part and you could look at any other part like bach and you could play the two of them and they would be a tune it was crazy so i looked at his scores a lot just to see kind of what is he doing? I mean, he knew, you know, harp pedaling, guitar, how to write like acoustic guitar, arpeggios and chords and, and I mean, crazy stuff. And wow. he had, you know, great players and such. So I, I learned a really a lot from him. Wow. Uh, so that big learning experience. But yes, being in an orchestra, playing good horn charts by people other than myself writing, you know, seeing what I liked of theirs or didn't like of theirs, you know, so a little bit. Yes. Yeah. And obviously your relationship with Quincy was an easy one. And you, there was a lot of trust there. And, and we know the trust with an artist or producer is that's everything. Definitely. Um, but when you worked with outside producers and outside writers and, and there was a balance or a disagreement. Can you talk generally about ways that you navigated that disagreement and tension that would happen or, you know, producer has an idea that's nuts and you don't want to lose the gig. And uh, it, it, I learned early on that um, I'm, I'm, they're hiring me and, and I give them the best of what I can for what I think they want. But if they don't like what I wrote, I'm okay with that. Um, we'll, you know, we'll try to make it so that you like something. Uh, you know, as opposed to other guys that come in and, you know, this is what it is, but you, know, you can't change anything. It's not my record, it's their record. And if they don't like it, it's not gonna be, make the record. So at least if, if I'm writing something that they don't like, and I can change it to something they do like, and then they feel that they have an input into my writing and playing, then it's going to be more likely to be on the record and be heard. So, I, you know, whatever you want, I'll try to do whatever you want. And, you know, even as crazy as it can be, let's, let's try it. Let's see what happens. A lot of that with Maurice White and the Earth, Moon and Fire sessions. You know, I, I wrote a chart one time and he said, come on in and we'll talk it over because we do a rough just a real rough pass and mistakes and everything, you know, but this is what it is. Um, let's, let's try this. And we'd start over, for, you know, get a new piece of paper, start over. Wow. So, you know, fine. So, you know, I'm, I'm kind of okay with that. You know, it's, it's when, when it gets abusive that it's bad, you know, that, that, you know, can, can you play that, uh, can you play those eighth notes a little longer? And we're already playing them as long as we can. And I, you know, I said, well, you know, you've got to actually go ta-da-da-da-da. You know, there is a 
split second in there where, you know, there's going to be a stop of sound. Maybe we should play a whole note there. No, I don't want that. I mean, you know, stupid stuff like that. And you must have worked well, with people who, who don't know what they want. Sort of like, I'm not sure what I like, but I'll know it when I hear it. And then you're hunting and pecking for hours and... Well, I always come in with something. I mean, not always. There yeah. have been times where, you know, we want you to do a horn chart. Can you come over now? You know? Okay, you know, and then come up with stuff on the spot. You know, but, yeah, there have been times where, you know, it's taken us a minute to get it, but not that often. People know what I do, and, you know, they know that, you know, I've, I had a pretty good track record there for a while. So, you know, you, you get, if you call me, then you you get what I think is right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And and what about uh, Tamara wrote down some notes for some questions. She's here helping me out. Uh, Good. People are asking questions and she's writing down some choice wins. Uh, and somebody asked a good question. What's your creative process now for arranging? Has it changed? Is it different? Is it? The, because these people want demos, I'm, you know, I'm a logic hack. I mean, I can do it. It's slow going. Uh, so that, you know, it, that becomes a, a part of the process, which slows me way down. But the good news is then you can print it out and you got parts for everybody. And, you know, so that's good. But, it, you know, it, it hasn't changed a whole lot. I listen to a song and the first thing I hear I down and because that's usually close to what I think it should be and then you know and then I got to struggle with logic for an hour to get the lick in right and hopefully it's not like a triplet lick that you know you can't make a triplet sixlet in you know, crazy stuff but <clears throat> You know, it's basically the same. It's just, you know, logic is in the way now as opposed to a pencil. I could listen to, I mean, my, the old style was I had a Walkman, headphones, watching the Lakers basketball game, and I could write a horn chart <laughs> on pencil, you know. Yeah. But, you know, times change, so. Yeah, the Lakers aren't the same as they were then. Oh, yeah, they are. <laughs> oh, man, they're killing this year. <laughs> Well, not right now. Finally. Huh? Not right now. Not right now, but no. <laughs> uh, well, enough of this music stuff. Let's talk about something really important. Uh-oh. Um, wine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when did you start the wine obsession, and who got you started? Because I know you... you you played on several, uh, and this probably is just pure coincidence, but uh, Takio, uh, Toshiko and Lou Tabakin are big wine people, and you played Thanks. with them over the years. I don't know if they influenced some of that or if uh, if it was just purely something that with Quincy. Uh, going back to Don Pystrup. Uh, <coughs> so we'd, ha we'd have the jingle sessions, and he would do back in his heyday probably for 20 years he probably averaged 10 jingles a week and he had an 8000 model wine cellar that he started back in the early 60s so he was buying stuff like super high end stuff for next to nothing then so he we would have these jingles, say a jingle at 10 o'clock in the morning. It's an hour long. And then at 11 o'clock, there would be 10 or 12 bottles of wine open. Let's try these wines. <laughs> I, and like crazy wine, you know, like stuff that was back then in the 70s, probably $100 a bottle, wow. you know, which is probably, they're probably two thousand dollars a bottle now right. and he was just bringing oh let's try this and I'm, let's try this you know and and one of the 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 one time he brought down port and i never had port vintage port we're gonna have some port today okay 45 
Taylor's vintage Ford. And that was kind of his house wine. So he's opening all this stuff. So you got you, you got to get into it. And he, the, the first thing that I really had was a really great red burgundy that he poured me at before I played at 10 in the morning, one morning. I said, Don, just let me play this part first. And, you know, and then I'll try it. And I wasn't really drinking at that point. And I took a taste of this stuff and I was like, oh my God, what is this? You know, it was a mind blowing wine. Uh, one of those wines that's like 5,000 a bottle now. Uh, and it, it was just like, so eye opener. And then, so, I mean, this continued on for 20 years with Don, that he would bring down, it got to a point where he would bring down, you would, you would go for the jingle and hang for the rest of the day drinking wine with him. And he would open, you know, a case or two of wine, a killer wine. Wow. Uh, but the first thing, when I tasted this wine, he said, uh, you know, you should buy some of this wine. It's called Domaine Romani Conti. And I said, well, okay. I, I said, how much is it? And he says, well, they have an assorted case of their vineyards. And this company is the number one, uh, maybe most valuable wine producing company uh, in France and the world, maybe, the most highly regarded. He said she should buy a, a, this assorted case of, of this wine uh, in 1978, vintage. And I said, well, how much is it? He says, it's 1050 for a case. And I said, you are out of your mind. I am not spending 1050 for this case. For and what year wine. would have that been? Uh, 79. Yeah, that's a lot of money in 79. That was a lot of money in 79. And I was, I mean, I was working a lot, but still, that was a lot of money. Yeah. And he says, I said, Don, I don't, I, that's too much money. This, this is the first case of wine that I'm buying. That's, that, that's a lot of money. I don't think I can spend that much. And he says, I already paid for it. You're going to pay me. Wow. So, so we ordered this case. So this case now, if I still had that case... It's worth about a hundred thousand. That case, it's just stupid, stupid. I still have a couple bottles from that case wow. that are now <clears throat> six or seven thousand a bottle, something stupid like that. So it was really Don Pystrip that started me off on all this wine stuff, and then there was another jingle guy here who, because of Don, got started in wine, and. He would go over to France a couple times a year and buy wine and bring it back. And so, yeah, it's cost me a fortune. <clears throat> and what's your single favorite desert island wine? Uh, Produce, that's in, it, pretty impossible. Well, it's pretty impossible. I guess it would, uh, of the wines that I've had, desert island means hot weather. So that, you no, know. No, 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 no. No, desert island just means... Oh. You don't isolate it. You, you, you got one wine. Wow. Well, there was there was a special wine made in 1947 Bordeaux called Cheval Blanc that that I had one time, and that was another eye opener. It was like nothing I'd ever tasted before, and many people say it might be the greatest wine from the 20th century. Wow. So. I went on kind of on a search for that in the kind of mid early eighties when the dollar was really high and uh, the French franc was really low. So you could get some pretty good values then. Although this wasn't really a good value, I didn't think. It was three hundred and twenty five a bottle then and probably eighty four maybe. But you know, it's a thirty seven year old wine. So, okay, so I bought seven bottles. So it was, you know, 2,500 kind of with tax and everything, which you know, is a crazy amount of money. But now they're authentic. It's, it's maybe the hot, most highly forged wine in the world. Wow, wow. And authentic bottles now are like 25,000 a bottle. Jeez, and you have uh, some? Great, uh, I had my last bottle about Four years ago, maybe. 
Uh, but again, Don Pystrup, uh, we went out to dinner a couple of years ago, and I had a bottle of 1961 Chateau Latour, which is one of his favorite wines. And I knew he had still had two of these same bottles that I bought of 47 Cheval Blanc. And I said, I'll bring 61 Latour if you bring 47 Cheval Blanc. And he goes, great. <laughs> so we had that dinner a couple of years ago. It was stupid. Wow. Yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and have a great day. Yeah, fun. Thanks for joining me for this episode of The Right Key. If you enjoyed the episode, there's a lot more coming. Please click the subscribe and like buttons below. If you want to know more about me or our guests, you can find lots of information in the link just below the video. See you next time.